and my brothers after me. You could hear the noise from where we lived, but nothing compared to the size of the place. They put me to work on 401. That's what we called her. And you should be the largest passenger ship in the world. We didn't call her Titanic then. I was there from the beginning. I was the ship race to lay the keel blocks. They sent out doing blocks on the slip way to start with. Then the keel at top of it, like a backbone. And the frames attached to that, like a skeleton. Workshops everywhere. It took weeks to find your way around. The workshops of every trade you ever heard of. Painters, sail makers, coppersmiths, boiler makers, cabinet makers. I even learned a bit about French, but also nothing. Harlem Roof was a fine place to work, but dangerous. Every ship crossed the lake, and there'd be lots of injuries besides. I was in the engine works for a while. Very well equipped it was. That's where we built the triple expansion engines. Two of them, each as high as a three-story house. I worked in the frame bending shop. You had heat steel beams in the furnace, then hit them on the slabs with cast iron, and hammer them curved. It was still work. You had to bend them more than you needed, because the frames straightened out a little when it cooled. The shell plates had made up a hull, weighed up to four and a half tons. <laughs> they were taller than the da. The plates were overlapped on the edges. Some were raised, one after another. We called it clencher. One of the four men told me years ago, that's how you built these ships. I worked as a heater boy. You had to heat the rivets on a wee plate. You pumped the bellows till the rivet was quite hot. Then you get a hold of it with your tongs and throw it up to the catcher. And he put it in the hole in the plate with the holder up. There were two of us on the other side of the plate with the holder up. We had to hammer the rivets so it filled the hole before it turned all red. The double bottom. That's a wee space we call the tanks, made up of steel plates. The rest of the rivet squad all had to fit into that gap. One of the four men would check each rivet with a special hammer. If it made a ringing sound, we'd have to get back and chase it out after work. I'd get scared working down in that double bottom. You only had candles for light. And the constant hammering against the gel plates. You could hear it all over Belfast. Some of those boys ended up stone deaf, so they did. We were paid 31 bob a week. The heater boy and catcher got 16 bob. But we all worked the same 54 hours. The upper deck was steel too, and part of the strength of the ship. There's no straight lines in the ship. And when you look down the lower deck, you can see the shear of the hull, a stuck to reflection at sea. The stern frame had to be strong enough to take the rudder and turning in heavy seas. You'd have all these timbers and guy wires to steady the frame, and men scurrying around like ants underneath. When we came to launch day, I was torn between pride and fear. The standing waves were coated in tallow, trade oil and soft soap. So the ship would slide and the ship would weight off the blocks. That was the most dangerous part. And the shipwrights were knocking away the last props. They were on the compression, you see, and the sliding ways would be released by the hydraulic trigger. One hundred thousand people watched the launch. Some paid a bob to sit in the reserve seating. There were extra trams laid on. Then we all went off to the pub to wish her well. Doc, you were proud to be an island man that day. And Titanic was the pride of Belfast. Thank you for joining us. The tour will end in a few seconds. Please exit the car carefully and make sure you don't leave any personal possessions behind. When the car has stopped, Push the lap bar down and lift up to exit safely. And mind your step as you leave the car. We look forward to seeing you again.